Hey everybody, Daniel from Space Talk here. Just a quick heads up before we get started. Our original science fiction audio drama, The Sojourn, is now available on Audible, Google Books, Patreon, Scribed, and iTunes. We've been really excited to see the reception it's been getting, and if you're interested in checking it out, you can find the links below this video. If you decide to get the series through Patreon and pledge at Wanderer tier or higher, not only will you get every volume of The Sojourn as and when it's completed, but you'll also get access to The Sojourn Visual Dictionary, which is our comprehensive digital law book on The Sojourn, done in the style of the classic Star Wars visual dictionaries. Please do consider checking it out, it's a real passion project for us and I think a lot of you would really enjoy it. Hey everybody, Daniel from Space Dock here, and The Expanse just gave us, at the very least, the best space battle since the Battle of New Caprica, and perhaps dethroned even that. Naturally, we'll have full spoilers for Season 5, Episode 10 of The Expanse moving forward, wherein we saw the Rosinante engage with the increasingly mutinous Free Navy fleet made up of the heavy frigate, the Serio Mal, the Morrigan-class patrol destroyer, the Koto, and Drummer's three-ship pirate fleet made up of the Tynan the Moteng and the DeWalt. This battle was just so well done, so perfectly done. Not only is it the usual dance of spectacle and physics and beautiful realism that The Expanse always manages, but it was a masterclass in consistency and stakes and detail. Early in the episode, we get a breakdown of the situation from Holden. They have very few PDC rounds left and limited fuel, and they're basically assuming that what they're now doing is going to be a suicide run. And while this initially seems like it's just building up the stakes and the tension, some of the details are crucial later. Holden talks about how they will be overwhelmed with torpedoes because they don't have enough PDC rounds to hold them off, until they can reach effective range with their railgun. And this is later paid off by the sequence of perfectly timed distractions as the Free Navy becomes increasingly mutinous that allows the Rossi to use its railgun. One of the first things we see is Drummer taking out Corral on board the Tynan, and then disabling the engines of the DeWalt with a torpedo. This is also followed by a blink-and-you'll-miss-it order to the Motang, telling them to stand down. We never see the crew of the Motang or who's captaining it throughout the whole season, but it's worth noting that they do cooperate here and stand down when told to, so they're obviously more of the kind of moderate side of Drummer's crew. Then we get the Tynan firing all of its torpedoes at once at the small Koto, and if we look closely you can see the torpedoes split into two groups and approach the ship from the two sides where it has PDCs. This class of ship has no PDC on the ventral side, and could potentially be overwhelmed if it had been approached from one direction with the one PDC, but that's not the objective here. This volley of torpedoes is buying time for the Rosinante to get its railgun rounds off. It's distracting the target ship long enough to allow the Rossi to get close enough to finish it off, and that's exactly what happens. We see the two railgun rounds come in out of nowhere, one of them goes through the bow, and the second goes straight through the reactor and takes the whole ship out. You really can stop, like, any moment of this and see a million great little details, and you know what? That's exactly what we're going to do in this video. As much as I lament the loss of any Morrigan class ship, them being as gorgeous as they are. The Rossi tears straight past this one, having taken it out. And then we get another great sequence where the Rossi drops a few torpedoes towards the Serio Mal. Because of the distribution of the engagement, they all immediately rotate to decelerate themselves because both ships are under thrust. And then we see the Serio Mal firing all of its torpedoes from a million different ports. This uh, heavy frigate design is gorgeous. I really love it. We saw two unused concept arts uh, of the MCR and Heavy Frigates in Amazon X-Ray, uh, but unfortunately we never got the artwork of this final design, which is a shame because it really does look fantastic. And in this moment, it fires off a lot of its torpedoes and tasks them to different objectives. Some of them head straight for the Rossi, some of them split into groups and prematurely detonate to create blasts to intercept the approaching torpedoes. Very rarely do we see interceptor missiles used in science fiction, despite being a very real part of modern naval warfare but it's used very believably and very spectacularly in this sequence. Uh, then we cut back to the Rossi, preparing to defend itself against the approaching torpedoes. We're reminded that one of its PDCs is out of commission, and also that they have not very much in the way of PDC ammo left. So then we get these kind of conservative, well-timed PDC bursts to preserve ammo and take out the torpedoes that are approaching them. You can even see Bull rolling the ship so as to use more than one PDC rather than draining all of the ammo out of one of them. Uh, we then get the mutiny aboard the DeWalt, which then fires all of its torpedoes, and wow, the DeWalt has like significantly more torpedoes than I had been thinking it had for the whole season. It's got this huge salvo of them ready to drop, and it fires all of them at the Serio Mal. Again, this is a well-timed distraction for the Rossi. The Serio Mal's firing all of its PDCs back at this huge approaching volley of torpedoes. 
some of which almost get through. But nevertheless, the distraction is just long enough for the Rosie to tear in for this awesome sequence. We see the first railgun shot fired that glances the uh, Serio Mal, and then the Rosie's engine cuts out so that it can strafe past the ship and begin firing the railgun from multiple angles. But if we look closely, in the instance when the railgun is fired, the drive cone is lit again for brief intervals to provide just enough arresting force against the recoil of the railgun so as to not mess with the ship's trajectory as it's strafing it. It's literally like half a second of screen time and the VFX people put this stuff in for people like us because the whole show really, it's just a masterclass in realism and detail, it's beautiful. We get a couple of glancing railgun blasts again as well as some going through the ship uh, from starboard to port. This is obviously doing a lot of damage but the ship is still going right up until the Rosie gets into a position to fire that crucial raking fire bow to stern blast all the way through the length of the ship and straight through the reactor and then it's dead. Perfectly done. Not only is this whole sequence just incredibly realistic and wonderful spectacle, but it's also a plausible way for this extremely difficult odds situation to be resolved. It doesn't seem contrived or that anything has any kind of plot armor. A ship that thought it was going to its death, basically, survives by means of a number of well-timed distractions and some competent reactive tactics from Bull and Holden. I'd say this has one-upped the stealth ship battle from Thoth Station in Season 2 and given us just one of the most glorious displays of space physics and space battle action put to screen. But that wasn't even the the only space battle in the episode because towards the end we get the Marco Inaro's fleet charging the Sol Ring. Now here we have uh, two UNN Truman class ships, those being the UNN Tripoli, which you'll remember from season four as the ship in charge of the ring defense grid for the UNN, and the UNN Montenegro, as well as a Donager class battleship from the Martians, the MCRN Saga Matha. The sequence opens with yet another brilliant display of continuity by the Expanse people as the defense fleet is hit by stealth-coated micrometeoroids. I love that the Free Navy's access to stealth composites and various asteroids was not abandoned simply because it wasn't a main plot point anymore. It's still a tool in their arsenal, and of course they would use it again because it fits their guerrilla warfare tactics perfectly. A lesser show would have forgotten about that, but not here. All three of the defending battleships are heavily weakened by this, and the Sagamatha actually loses one of its heavy railguns, as you can see in an opening flyby shot. But this doesn't stop it because the Donager class is capable of being held together by sheer middle finger energy, and basically stands its ground with one working railgun against an enormous fleet for longer than it has any right to until finally it's stabbed in the back by Medina Station. But at least we got another few moments of the Donager class being endlessly badass on screen. And finally we have the Martian Separatist fleet turn up to take out the unsuspecting UNN Tripoli from its flank. Again, another perfectly realistic plot armor free depiction of a lesser force defeating powerful modern battleships through a combination of stealth-coated micrometeoroids and ambushes from people who they think are friendly. Another entirely believable sequence, plus some of the best capital ship battle footage we've ever got on screen from this show, as we're now getting longer beauty shots, some fantastic wide-angle shots of the Donager class holding its own. Earlier in the episode, actually, we got a really great fly-around of the Serio Mal it's really great that the show has reached this point where it can do these gorgeous long beauty shots and show off these fantastic designs in all of their detail and glory. And it's very well deserved because frankly this show is filled to the brim with some of the best sci-fi spacecraft designs ever put to screen. And it's only got better this season with the Pella and the Serio Mal. There really is not much more to say aside from that this is just a masterclass in creating rules and sticking by them to make the best possible space action for the visual medium. If you've ever seen my How to Write a Space Battle video, you'll immediately recognize that this engagement follows all of the rules I laid out there to the letter. This is frankly the milestone by which the quality of space battle sequences should be measured. And the best part is this is definitely not the best The Expanse is going to get. If any of you have read Babylon's Ashes and know where the next season will be going, this really is the tip of the iceberg. And I am so so excited to see this one-upped again next season. For those of you who do not believe that New Caprica has yet been dethroned as the king of the space battle, I suspect it certainly will have been by the end of season six. So thanks again to the Expanse people for yet another beautifully written, textured, and nuanced season of television, topped off with a flawlessly executed space battle for all of us spaceship nerds to lose our minds over. Thank you all for watching. This is Daniel from Space Doc, signing off. Thank you for watching Space Doc. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please do check out the links on the screen right now or in the description below for our Patreon and channel membership services. Anything you can pledge goes towards improving our team and our equipment and allowing us to put together bigger and more exciting video projects for you guys on the channel.